<laughs> so is it all broadcasting now? We'll confirm in a second as soon as we're live. I'll, I will do the same again and just await confirmation. <laughs> so is it all to Just waiting for confirmation. Mm -hmm. I've just received the confirmation it's working. Okay, the, the chair's uh, muted, so you may want to unmute the chair. Okay, so we're Ellie's just also receiving that confirmation. I can't <laughs> mute him. <laughs> Kelly, you're, you're muted. Sorry, everybody. I can confirm we've had confirmation that we are live streaming, so the meeting can now commence. Thanks, Cal. Can you uh, unmute the chair? Okay, perfect. Real. All right. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, welcome, everyone, to the meeting of the Policy and Resources Committee. Uh, uh, I'm James Roberts. I'm the chair. Uh, so I'm going to move uh, to explain how the meeting is going to work. Uh, during the meeting, all the microphones and cameras will be switched off, with the exception of myself and any presenting officers other than as directed by the meeting facilitator. Should anyone leave the meeting for any reason, the meeting will continue unless it's no longer corrupt. <clears throat> Please ensure that any items that are relating to personal, private, confidential or exempt information are, are not visible through your camera or screen sharing until any press and public have been excluded from the meeting. Please be advised that all proceedings of this meeting will be recorded and broadcast on YouTube live for members of the public to see. Uh, please ensure that when you're not speaking, your microphone remains on mute and that your camera is switched off. <clears throat> If you do wish to speak at any point, please turn on your camera and raise your hand or alternatively indicate via the chat function. Uh, the meeting facilitator will then unmute your microphone and invite you to speak at the appropriate time. You should then click to confirm that you wish to unmute your microphone and then state your question or comment. Uh, please don't try to unmute yourself. The meeting facilitator will do this for you. There'll be a slight delay and then you'll be prompted to allow yourself to be unmuted. Please select the blue button that says unmute now to do so. Uh, when I request you all to approve or note an item, I'll ask you to turn on your camera and the meeting facilitator will then unmute everyone. If you have any issues, this will be your opportunity to raise them uh, and your silence will be taken as an approval. <coughs> so I can confirm that the following members are in attendance uh, and that all members present can, uh, can hear and be heard. So that's myself, Councillor James Roberts, uh, Councillor Dan Barrington, Councillor Les Byram, Councillor Angela Coleman, Councillor Andrew Makinson, Councillor Steph O'Keefe, uh, Councillor Leslie Rennie, uh, as well as Councillor Brian Kenny and Emily, Councillor Emily Spurrell, who are uh, alternating today. So let's proceed on to the agenda. Uh, item one, do we have any apologies for absence? Oh, we have apologies from Councillor Jean Stapleton and from Councillor Lisa Preston. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any declarations of interest? No? Okay, uh, I understand there's no matters of urgency which have been admitted onto the agenda. So uh, to give a warning of exempt items, uh, Appendix A on item 10 and item 11 uh, are exempt items. So at that point we'll exclude the press and public. So moving on to item two, the minutes of the last meeting. Uh, we need to approve those minutes. So could members turn on their cameras uh, clicking start video in the bottom left hand corner of the screen. Uh, the meeting facilitator will unmute everyone to provide you with the opportunity to raise any issues with regard to the minutes. If you wish to raise anything, please click to confirm that you want your microphone unmuted and then state your comment. <clears throat> and your silence will be taken as approval of the minutes. Does anyone have any comments? No? Then I'll take the minutes uh, as approved. Thank you. Can you turn your cameras off again? Okay. Item three, uh, we've got the statement of assurance. Uh, can the Chief Fire Officer, Phil, speak to those, please? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, the purpose of this report is to request that members consider and approve the authority's statement of assurance for 2019 through 2020 for publication onto the authority's website 
and the specific recommendations are that the members consider the information contained within the report and approve the draft statements of assurance and if approved the statement of assurance be signed by the chair um, of Merseyside Financial Authority and the chief fire officer prior to its publication uh, and the purpose of the statement of assurance is to provide uh, the public um, with assurances around the provisions of our firefighting capabilities across the p previous uh, year. So pay that is, this statement of assurance covers is from April 2019 to March 2020. And it's a direct reflection of the requirements placed within the Fire and Rescue Services National Framework as published in 2012 and revised in 2018, which explicitly asks Fire and Rescue Authorities must provide an annual assurance to their community and to government on a financial governance and operational matters. The actual statement of assurance then is covered off in Appendix A, which is pages 21 to 43, Chair, and I'm happy to take any questions on the statement of assurance itself. Thank you, Chief. Uh, if any members have any questions about item three, then can you please turn your camera on now? No. So can we take that, uh, that item uh, as presented? Okay. So we accept that item. Uh, move on to item four then. Uh, item four is the financial review. Uh, could the Treasurer, Ian Cummins, uh, please speak to this? Thanks, Chair. Uh, the report covers the revenue and capital budgets, reserves, and Treasury management updates up to the 30th, 30th of September 2020. The revenue position is covered in paragraph 6 to 13, pages 15 to 18. Paragraph 7 outlines the budget movements in the second quarter. As all of the adjustments are self-balancing and have been budgeted for, they have not impacted on the approved net budget requirements, and that remains at £61.961 million. Pounds. Paragraph 9 reviews the robustness of the approved key budget assumptions, and in particular, the McLeod remedy assumption that the cost to the employer of allowing the fire pension scheme members access to their legacy schemes would be considered as part of the 2020 actuarial review and reflected in the employer rates from 2023-24. And the financial impact of COVID-19 on the authority can be contained within the government funding received by the authority. The current position is that these assumptions remain robust and all costs can be contained within the approved budget. Paragraphs 10 to 12 on pages 49 to 51 summarises the latest forecast revenue position. After reviewing income and expenditure, officers have identified the following favourable variances. £125,000 saving from the firefighter employee budget. This is as a result of retirement numbers being slightly ahead of the expected forecast. £225,000 saving from the non-firefighter employee budget. And this is a result of staff vacancies arising from staff turnover in the year and staff not being at the top of their substantive grade. 157,000 saving from the local government pension scheme, pension budget, as a result of a refund due to the authority being in surplus at the end of the last actuarial review. 100,000 pounds saving from the other employee cost budget, as staff training and subsistence expenditure has reduced as conferences, courses, and other training was postponed or held online due to COVID-19 restrictions. Overachievements of approved support savings and other technical adjustments have resulted in an additional permanent saving of £515,000 with a further one-off saving of £45,000. A forecast favourable variance of £3.069 million on the revenue costs associated with servicing capital expenditure funded via borrowing. This is possible due to the deferral of new borrowing by utilising internal cash, mainly monies held in reserves and unapplied grants, resulting in a saving on expected debt interest payments, 
and the authority has made significant additional voluntary MRP payments in recent years. And by making only the minimum statutory MRP payment this year, it would free up some of the MRP provision. Together, this will deliver a 3.069 million favourable variance against the £6.3 million budget. The authority has received £114,000 of additional specific grant to cover compensation for the government small business rate relief. A saving of £100,000 has been identified from the contingency provision for price increases, as some inflationary pressures have been contained within the overall base budget. Overall, as outlined in the table on page 51, a favourable variance of 4.440 million has been identified. And as outlined in paragraph 12, the authority meeting on the 15th of October supported the proposal by the chief to look at building a new TDA at a cost of up to 25 million pounds, subject to a further report confirming costs and funding. And in the last financial review report, members approved that any future additional savings in 2021 be used to increase the capital investment reserve in order to contribute towards the cost of a new TDA development. Therefore, members are asked to approve the use of the 4.440 million fable variance to increase the capital stroke TDA reserve. In terms of the capital position, paragraph 15 outlines a small increase of £14,000 in the capital programme due to an increase in ICT hardware expenditure funded via a revenue contribution. The reserve position is outlined in paragraph 17 on page 52. In quarter two, a net contribution of £112,000 was made to reserves due to a requirement to reimburse the energy uh, saving reserve from an energy savings that have materialised following investment in energy efficiency schemes funded from this reserve and a contribution to the PFI annuity reserve to ensure sufficient funding exists in the reserve to smooth out the revenue budget contribution to the unitary charge over the life of the PFI initiative. Following a review of the current reserves, the report proposes to realign some reserves to increase the capital TDA reserve in light of the proposed the proposal for a new TDA. The report identifies that half a million pounds from the recruitment reserve and 200,000 from the inflation reserve can be transferred into the capital reserve. And then moving on finally to treasury management, treasury management performance is outlined in paragraph 18 to 23 on pages 52 to 56. The performance of Treasury management was consistent with the approved Treasury management strategy. And at the end of September, the authority held £48.2 million of investments. And a breakdown of these investments is contained in the table after paragraph 21. All investments are consistent with the approved investment strategy and within the limits outlined in paragraph 21. No new loans have been taken out in the year so far. Members are asked to note the report, approve the revenue, capital and reserve adjustments outlined in the report and the increase in the capital TDA reserve of £4.440 million funded from the favourable variance outlined in the report. Instruct the Treasurer to continue work with, to work with managers to max, maximise savings in the year and I'm happy to take any questions on the report, Chair. Thank you, Ian. Uh, okay, so I've got three people who have switched their cameras on so far. So if I can take Councillor Leslie Byram first. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's um, just a comment, really. Um, I, I, the Treasurer Chief and I have had some correspondence from the Minister uh, who says, you know, you've got loads of capital, use that uh, for the pay rises, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't quite he doesn't say that for the pay rise, he just said you've got loads of capital. I, I know this is a backward-looking report um, in that respect, but when we come to, this is for members' information, when we come to the outturn and to settle the details for next year's budget, 
we need to liaise and with the government, with the Home Office, on this whole issue. We are holding a certain amount of capital on their behalf, which they it would seem that they've counted in. A. B, we need to point out to them again, we don't have an individual capital program. We don't get a capital grant fund. They're confused with the police and with other local authorities who receive a capital grant. We don't. So the only way that we can put capital together is to, you know, save little bits of our revenue and put them towards very important things such as replacing fire engines and fire stations and the TDA, essential things. Anyway, I won't go into too much detail, just to just advise members um, that there is this discussion going on uh, with the Home Office, and it's probably more about next year's budget setting process uh, than it is about the outturn and the current situation. But just for information, thank you. Thanks, Les. Okay, Councillor Emily Spurrell. Um, thanks, Chair. I mean, Les potentially may have touched upon my what my question was going to be, and this might be a conversation for, for a future budget meeting, but um, I wanted to ask about the capital financing and the money that we've that we've saved in terms of it's led to the variance. And I think I've asked this before, but I'm still trying to get my head around it. What are the what's the kind of long term impact of this? So what we're saying is we've put off any debt paying, which has given us the, the variance, is that right? And so what's the long term Strategy of that. Yeah, it, it, it's not quite the case. What it is is that we have a statutory requirement to make provision for a minimum repayment of debt. So we're not touching that. So we're not going against any regulations or directions. What we did a few years back is rather than build up reserves for the for the issues that Les has raised. We said that any savings that we identify in those years, we would use to make additional provision for future debt repayment. And what that has meant that it's enabled us to free up over a short period, a fixed period of time, some of that £6.3 million budget that we have for servicing debt is being freed up in the short term and we will need in in the medium term to to cover future capital investments so it's a bit it's a bit cyclical so what i'm suggesting now is rather than continue to use that freed up budget that is only over the short term to continue a strategy of paying additional debt off so at some point in the future we'd free up more of the budget we're, we're, we're taking the opportunity now to benefit from what we've done in the past and say we've got a window of a couple of years where the 6.3 million we've got for service and debt isn't fully committed because we paid debt off early. And that, that we're benefiting from, from that, freeing up some of this MRP budget for a couple of years, we're now dipping into that windfall, which we plan to do at some point. We're just choosing to do it now. So there's no consequence of us building up a problem for the future as such. We're just making good of a of a temporary uh, freeing up of budget committed to servicing debt because we paid it off early from money we freed up in the previous years, if that makes sense. It's I quite complicated. Yes. It's difficult. Yeah, so because we've been kind of overpaying and being very proactive around paying off debt previously, we've now got a more comfortable position to use some of that funding for the for the reserves that you've identified. Yeah, okay. I think I'm yeah. with you now. Yeah, I, I, and you know, maybe if I just use one example, uh, in terms of ICT... I want to make sure it's for it and everything. Oh, sorry. So I just heard something. Are we okay? Are we still online? I just heard Kelly. Kelly, are we okay? Kelly, on here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you take ICT as an example, we say IT has an asset like five years. So we invest in IT every year. So if we invested in IT last year, we would have to create an MRP to repay that IT off over the next five years. Right. What I did, I used some savings from last year and paid off the full IT investment in one year. I see. So the MRP that I would have needed over the next five years to make that contribution, I don't right. need, but I will need it in year six because we'd have to replace that ICT investment. And I that's see. why I'm so what I've done is I paid that off early, but I don't, haven't freed up the MRP 6.3 million 
permanently. I have a window that we have an opportunity to dip into it. Um, and what I've done consistently over the past few years is use that to pay additional MRP. Right, and I MRP. see. And I'm now, I'm now dipping into that because what we said is that strategy was to deliver either a short-term resource to meet a financial challenge that we faced or to fund infrastructure investment. And because the TDA is mm. the new TDA infrastructure investment, I'm now saying, right, we need to now start to build up the reserve because we to, to borrow 25 million would be a significant commitment. If we can fund a significant proportion of the TDA from specific resources, not debt, it makes it more affordable and sustainable as a proposal when that comes back to members in a few months' time to sign off the, the new TDA proposal. Okay, Hopefully that thank makes you. sense. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Andrew Makinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, question on page 72 on the capital expenditure. Uh, third line, Windows 7 Security Assurance Extended Security Updates, £12,000. Now, it's a small budget line. I'm more concerned about the implications of it. Windows 7 uh, is obsolete and has been stopped being supported by Microsoft in January, I believe. So I'm wondering why we're paying for it to uh, continue to be supported when uh, it, it, we did have the opportunity to upgrade uh, for free a few years ago. And perhaps leading more onto the later item on the risk, risk register, even with uh, paying for the extended support, there is a risk there in, uh, in using software that is obsolete. So how confident are we in the security of our systems that are using that? And are any critical systems actually still using this obsolete software? Yep. Yep. Thanks, Councillor. I'll try and answer this. It's more of an IT specialist here. But if you look at the, the page you've referred to there, page 72, under that IT002 ICT software, the last three lines there are called a Microsoft EA agreement. Now that, what we pay out there, we are allowed to use the latest software li um, uh, licenses that are available to us of so Microsoft 10, et cetera, et cetera. So we have, and we are in the process of finalizing that move. I, I think the 12,000, I think you notice it's only in 2021, was there was a few applications, and I know for the finance at one point was one of them, that until we upgraded our uh, finance application, it wouldn't work on Windows 10, it would only work on Windows 7. That's now been resolved and we have moved completely to Windows 10. So I think what it was, the 12,000 provision was there, it was more for delays in moving up to the latest uh, Windows, where applications were delaying that progress so as I understand it now, we have now reached a point where we've now all moved on to Windows 10 at least, and we don't face that risk. Uh, that's my understanding. Okay, thank you for that, Chad. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Leslie Rennie. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just a question really, which I tend to ask most years, and you might sort of know what I'm going to ask him, but um, on page 55, the uh, analysis of investments, um, I'm just a little concerned really about the amount of um, finance that we have invested in various local authorities. Um, if you add up um, clearly um, all the local authorities that we have um, investments in there, it comes to 22 million. Um, it's more than obviously that we've got invested within the uh, AAA uh, companies. Uh, just a little bit concerned about that really, especially you know, this year um, with the financial positions and the precarious positions really of many local authorities um, and also the difficult position that they find uh, balancing their budgets um, just need some assurances really about how secure our financial investments are with those. If you could just uh, give me some yeah. comfort and assurance, please. Yeah, I, I understand the point of the likes of Croydon Council and the issue of a section 114 notice when authorities are reaching a financial position in which their, their treasurer believes, you know, they're heading the position that is unaffordable and they need to stop uh, revenue expenditure. I, I, I suppose that the simple answer is it's unlikely, if not impossible, for any local authority to go bust. 
the government would send in the commissioners and they would have to then identify revenue savings to bring the budget back in balance, which wouldn't put at risk the repayment of this debt. This debt would always be repaid. I think it's more that when authorities like Croydon and others enter because of COVID and other reasons, uh, financial difficulties, it's the day-to-day revenue expenditure that they need to look at and reduce rather than maybe the, the, the likes of loans that they've taken out to be repaid. Because if they didn't repay them, you would find it very difficult going forward, I think, to get the, from Public Works Loan Board or any other source the capital funds they need to, to continue their infrastructure development. So I, I don't think there's a risk there. It's more about, I think, for those councils, the revenue services that they provide and the need to reduce them if they face their severe financial position the likes of Croydon or Northamptonshire County Council. Okay, th- thanks, Jack. And uh, just comment, yeah, I, I accept that. Um, I mean, cl- clearly this has been um, an issue in my own lo- local authority and myself and some of my colleagues have been quite vocal about it, um, but particularly, um, to put it crudely, because um, other authorities had been loaning at sort of mates rates, you know, for, uh, as I say, a crude way of putting it, but um, the uh, average interest percentage um, is really comparable with um, our investments in other areas here. So I suppose that does give me some comfort at the moment. But, um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm still a little uneasy about it, but uh, clearly I'll take the advice for those that, uh, like yourself, Ian, thank you very much. Um, I, I, and, just, just, and just to help, Leslie, obviously we place security as the highest criteria. So it tends to be security, which means it's got to be you know a safe investment, liquidity then that we can access the funds as and when we need them and yield is a little bit lower so sometimes you will accept a lower rate of return if it offers high security or high liquidity it's not always the highest return determines where you invest your money security is deemed more important okay yeah thank you for that thanks Ian. thank you chair thank you and the only other thing i'd add to that is that um uh, some of the other authorities uh, on Merseyside, the, uh, the the primary authorities, um, I, I find that their investment strategies are uh, you know, still not risky, but slightly riskier. Uh, I think that the Merseyside Fire Authority uh, Treasury Management Strategy is really prudent. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm all in favour of that as well. Uh, I did have a question myself. Um, it was looking again at the McLeod judgment. Uh, I notice we say that we can use the smoothing reserve of two million to to deal with it in the first year. Uh, presumably, that means that the impact in the first year we estimate to be less than two million. Um, I was wondering if we had a, an exact figure for the estimate, uh, or if we had um, and if we had an overall estimate using actuarial tables or whatever for the for the entire length of the the, the impact of the McLeod judgment. I suppose it's worth looking at McLeod in two ways. There's the issue of what it means if people go back into the legacy schemes. And I think particularly for the fire pension scheme, the 92 scheme, the employer rates were significantly higher. So the issue with McLeod on that is that we would have to make a significant increase in our contribution, potentially back to 2015 into the pension fund account. Now for that, we get quite a clear steer now from the Home Office that they will build that assessed liability, and they haven't given a figure, into the new rates from 23, 24 that we'll have to pay. And when we start talking about the budget for 21, 22, and the few four years beyond that, I'll be putting a provision in of about a million pounds from 23, 24 on the basis of about a three percentage uh, point increase in the employer rate to cover that liability. But to be perfectly honest, that's mo- as much a finger in the air as anything else. It, so the two million pounds smoothing reserve that you refer to and the potential cost this year, that was to cover us for two things. At one point, we were concerned that the Home Office had issued a informal guidance that said anyone approaching retirement to the firefighter pension scheme could have immediate access to their legacy scheme. And also they'd indicated that the employer would have to make good the contributions. So that's now changed in terms of the employee contributions. The Home Office have said, now that will be built into the actuary review. Don't worry about it. And in terms of 
acting on that informal guide. We're still waiting and we've signed up with the LGA and other fire to see clarification because we lack a lot of guidance that we require if we were to offer firefighters early access to the legacy scheme. So I don't see there being any need for the smoothing reserve to make good the um, outstanding or the employer arrears in terms of the contribution rate. The one thing I don't know, and it's the second side of the coin, the compensation payments. Because as I understand it, for hurt feelings and some financial loss by people moving in to the new schemes, they will be entitled to compensation. And I'm being told by a home office that compensation payments uh, cannot be charged to the pension account and the authority must fund and make good those payments. But at this point in time, there's no indication what a generic compensation payment would be for hurt feelings, let alone, I suspect there'll be individual claims for financial loss. My, my feeling is £2 million would be sufficient to meet any compensation payments that are identified in this year. But I would be surprised if any compensation payments are sort of identified and ratified before the end of this year. As I understand it, the consultation on the draft McLeod remedy, the government is still considering, and it won't be till the new year, at least until we hear something about that. And it may require primary legislation to uh, implement any final remedy. So you might not be looking until 2022, even 2023, before we're in a position where we know what the final remedy is and we know what the proposal is to compensate people for, for any financial loss or hair feelings. So I can't give you a figure, but hopefully that gives you a steer to say there's some comfort that the two million should be sufficient to meet the compensation payment and that the actuarial rates from 23-24 will, will reflect what we need to pay for the cost of the McLeod remedy in terms of the FPS. In terms of the local government pension scheme, in the 2019 actuary review, the employer was given two options to pay an employer rate without McLeod being built into it or an employer rate with an assumed implication of McLeod. We chose the latter. So our employer rate that we're currently paying for the LGPS from 2020 21 includes an element for McLeod. So I'm not expecting for the LGPS, which is a third of our staff, any change to the employer rate because we've already built it into the, the budget. Thanks, Ian. Um, well, can I, can I just say that I don't think, um, well, I think when the government introduces a policy in, in 2015, which is subsequently found to be illegal by the, the Supreme Court, uh, I don't really think it's right that local authorities should then be expected to shoulder the burden for, uh, at the very least, for additional costs which are caused by uh, by, by that judgment uh, and by that policy. Um, you know, there's, there's an argument to be had about whether the, the initial costs should be, but the, the additional ones should, in my opinion, definitely shouldn't. So I, I think it's unfair that we're being asked to put smoothing to reserves aside to deal with that. But nevertheless... Uh, I noticed the very last paragraph in the report uh, says that there's a, a 25.8 million firefighters pension grant received. Uh, I take it that's not, nothing to do with McLeod. That's that's a separate grant. Yeah, that's the annual grant we receive off the government because we are. It's a national scheme, the firefighter pension scheme, but the fire authorities administer it on behalf of of that scheme. So for us to enable us to pay out the pensions to the firefighters the government gives us the money to cover that from the pension fund and it tends to pay it in a lump sum around the July. So we get this big lump sum July to cover us for all the pensioners payments that we make on behalf of the pension fund. Okay. Uh, in, in this one, it says that the authority had investments of 48.2 million and that included a 25.8 million firefighters pension grant. I was looking at the, the next report uh, and it's, it mentions the same 48.2 million figure. Um, but it says that the firefighters' pension grants 30.1 million. So I was wondering if something changed between the two reports or if there's just a typo or... Oh, that's page 82. 
I'm going to say the first one figure is right because that's my figure. <laughs> and the other one came from our Treasury management colleagues in Liverpool. So I'm going to say that's their fault, but it's the first one that's right. And, I, and I'm going to say that they put the wrong figure in, but it's probably that I didn't tell them. Okay. As long as we've got it right you know, when we're doing the calculations. Good. Yeah. All right. So any further questions on that item? No. Nope. Okay, can we accept that item then uh, and move on to item five? Uh, so item five is the Treasury Management Report, Ian. Yeah, I mean, this will replicate a little bit what we've just discussed, um, but it's because the Treasury Management and Prudential Codes require the authority to prepare an interim Treasury Management Report on its activities during the year to ensure they're consistent with its approved Treasury Management Strategy and it's remained consistent with the approved prudential indicators. So this report meets that requirement and outlines the treasury management activities and performance for the first half of the year. So in a sense, it replicates a little bit what you've just heard, but it's to meet the requirements of those codes of having a separate interim report. So the interim report can be found on page 79. And page 80 contains an executive summary of the key points of performance so far and they are no new borrowings have been arranged in the year so far or expected to be arranged before the year end debt of 0.45 million is due to be repaid this year the authority had investments of 48.2 million the bank of england base rate remains at 0.1 percent throughout the year Longer term public works loan board rates have risen slightly during the first half of the year by 0.6 of a percentage point from 2.54 to 2.6. And treasury management activity has been carried out in compliance with the relevant codes and statutes and within the borrowing and treasury management limits approved by the authority as part of the budget setting process in February 2020. The recommendation is that members are asked to note the contents of the report. I'm happy to take any questions on it. Do any members want to turn their camera on if they want to ask a question? No, okay. I think this was mostly covered uh, in the previous report as well. I think they're very similar. Yeah. Uh, okay. In that case, uh, I move that the, the item's approved. Uh, and we'll move on to item six. So... Uh, item six is the corporate risk register. Uh, Chief. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, and the purpose of this report is to inform members of the current risks contained within the corporate risk register, the status of those risks and the associated control measures, including any updates from the period April to September 2020. And the recommendation is that members approve the updated corporate risk register for 2020-2021, which incorporates the current status of those risks. Um, and you know, members will also be aware that previously uh, we considered the outcomes of an internal audit report from April 2017 that considered the authority's approach to risk management and overall compliance was found to be good uh, and substantial uh, in some areas. Um, and there's a couple of particular um, actions which have been completed over that period and risks included, uh, two of which are contained within 411, which is environmental and political which is the concerns expressed around the utilisation of diesel vehicles um, and, and a requirement or a consideration as part, part of our uh, fleet management to move away from diesel vehicles to uh, more of an electric vehicle as and when the technology uh, advances. And also, you know, self-evidently, members will be aware there's a number of references now included in the risk register which relate directly to COVID-19 outbreaks and they have been considered across a number of the particular risks. Um, and so, Chair, I'm happy to take any questions around the particular risks contained within uh, the risk methodology or anything else for that matter. So, uh, happy to take any questions, Chair. Can anyone switch the camera on if they want to ask a question? No one's indicated, Chair. No. Okay. Uh, in that case, we'll, uh, we'll accept that report. Uh, and move on to item seven, which is the service delivery plan. Phil. Thanks, Chair. Again, the purpose of this report is to request that members scrutinise the performance 
against the objectives and performance targets and outcomes as set out within the service delivery plan 2019-20 uh, for the period April to September and the integrated risk management plan and the actions contained within our Her Majesty's Inspectorate action plan as well, uh, of which I will, I will reference as I move forward, uh, and the recommendation that we approve the attached report for publication uh, on the website. And members will be aware that the service delivery plan is, it forms a basis of, of our plan moving forward of, of accountability. It includes uh, actions contained within the functions of the, the authority, uh, and they are detailed as, as we move forward. Equally, I'll pick up on particularly the key and benchmark performance indicators against the targets as uh, approved by members in, in 2021. So the first section of the report as contained within the appendices covers off the service delivery plan and references the, uh, the details of the functional planning objectives and how they are being progressed. And then we'll go into a specific detail um, members in regards to the, the, the actual detail of each and every one, only to say that we're making good progress. There has been some implications to some of the areas around COVID, um, but the you know, vast majority are still on track for completion by the end of this year. If I move you to page 181, which is the, the service delivery plan um, and our performance, and I'll take you through the, the benchmark indicators, you will see that broadly the performance for the authority is in, in, in a good place um, and the, our performance is green in most areas um, and I'll highlight a couple of those areas particularly the number of fires attended by Merseyside Fire, fire and Rescue Service is significantly down uh, on the previous period um, and again the number of primary fires likewise. Unfortunately the number of deliberate dwelling fires and occupied premises has increased slightly above the target uh, and again you know, that we are we are working to address that. But our accidental dwelling fires and our anxious behaviour fires are significantly down on uh, the previous years. And, and, and the previous years in both of those areas being the best years that we've achieved previously. So again, the direction of travel is particularly good. Uh, members will also see that the number of special service calls attended has increased over the period. Uh, and that's not surprising given the amount of work that we are doing with and particularly ambulance colleagues in supporting them during the, during the pandemic uh, and really recognising the kind of contribution that fire and rescue services broadly, but Merseyside particularly, are making in, in support of our ambulance service colleagues and how we are responding and how we assist them deal with those particular incidents. What I would again draw members' attention to um, where, where we are not performing as as suspect as well as expected against the, the service target is around number of false alarms attended. Uh, and we had a particular spike in April, May, um, and we've, 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 the analysis has drawn us to the conclusion that was due to a large number of false alarm goes intense due to control burning, um, and that was exasperated during the bonfire period as well, where people were um, not going and not attending um, large events. They were choosing to have events in their, in their own back gardens. But as a result of the initial uh, lockdown, we see an increases in April, April, May, uh, as people chose to burn refuge and vegetation uh, rather than take it to the tip. Um, that said, our attendance standard and uh, the first attendant appliance uh, for all risk and life risk across Merseyside, uh, a, a response standard of 10 minutes, and that has been achieved on 95.4% against the 90% target. So again, uh, performing really well. And again, a particular focus I would suggest to, to members is the percentage of shifts lost to sickness absence. Bearing in mind that we are just working through a pandemic of where you know, the fire and rescue services has is contributed more broadly rather than just achieving its own statutory responsibilities. It's assisted partner agencies and how it's um, worked through the pandemic process. And our sickness absence is currently at 3.45% against the service uh, target of 4%. But I suppose the, the, if we were drawn into um, the removal of the COVID-19 related absence, that would be as low as 3.01%, which is you know, a, a significant improvement on previous uh, you know, performance, uh, but testimony to the kind of the focus um, of our staff. So our sick and substance is something to be to behold in, in the context of a, a global pandemic. And then the final you know, one relates to carbon output. And again, our carbon output of our buildings is, uh, is, is improving significantly. The RMP outcomes are then detailed within the report. I don't, again, I don't intend to go into great detail over them. I'm happy to take any questions, Chair, as we go. 
but needless to say, one of the kind of key um, RMP objectives was the the completion of the, um, the, the the build of the station in St Helens and the move to a hybrid model of that particular locality. That has now concluded, and albeit we haven't officially opened the fire station, the fire station is functioning really, really effectively. Um, and you know, and staff are thrilled by the environment that's being created for them. Uh, and so that kind of concludes one of the major component parts of the integrated risk management plan. There is still a little bit of work to be done on some of the more peripheral issues, but that's probably being held up to some degree in respect of uh, COVID. But you know, progress is being made and being made significantly, uh, and we are on track uh, in most areas. And again, Chair, I'm happy to take any specific questions around progress against the integrated risk management plan. And then the final document itself, which is contained within the pack, is in relation to our action plan against the inspectorate's findings. Um, and uh, as you will see, we are making progress against all areas. Uh, particularly, I'll draw members' attention to uh, the one about promoting the right values and culture. And there's a piece of work now taking place organisationally to consider refreshing the organisational values uh, given the fact that they were probably um, put in place probably over 10 years ago now and it's whether they are still fit for purpose. And we've been out to speak to uh, staff, um, you know, some of our um, diversity networks, some officers and, and so on and so forth to see whether they still reflect uh, the, the aims and the ambitions of the service. And we will come back to members if we choose to refresh them in, in any great uh, detail or anything more specific than that. Uh, and I'll probably pause at that point here to take any questions either on the function plans, the service delivery plans totality, the RMP, the inspectorate um, action plan, or indeed the performance. Do any members like to ask any questions on the service delivery plan? Councillor Sporrell. Thanks, Chair. Um, it was just a quick one on that last point, um, Phil, about the... Um, the values and stuff and just whether you could give a little update on the equalities kind of networks obviously i know things might have come to a stop with no, COVID no. things but has, has there been work going on kind of behind yeah. scenes yeah absolutely so now we've got a fully established lgbti you know, uh, network uh, an established gender network and an established BAME network uh, and the chairs have been very proactive uh, and we've brought the chairs onto our equality diverse inclusion board so we're getting, they are being part and part of the strategy, really, rather than the implementation. Uh, that's been really well received. Uh, and you know, the, the, I suppose the, the most detailed and up-to-date kind of representation of that is the BAME Network Chair assisted me delivering a national presentation on inclusive leadership, particularly related to um, uh, how the Fire and Rescue Services responded to uh, the COVID uh, pandemic from a inclusion perspective uh, and that was you know, incredibly well received by uh, colleagues nationally as well so uh, it may well be if, I, if I'm honest with you that we we re-deliver that, that presentation to members of the authority because I think they would get a great deal from it and rather than me present it I think it would be f far better if the BAME network chair presented it with the other network uh, chairs being represented at that Learning and lunch for members, I think uh, I think that would be really well founded. I equally think it would give members an opportunity to speak to the chairs of those uh, networks to see how it's how it's feeling and how inclusive the uh, the organisation is being in regards to their specific needs. So we can facilitate that. But they are going from strength to strength, uh, and you know, in, in a nice possible way. Really proud of the progress that's being made. Good, great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I was wondering, uh, Phil, what's the um, feasibility of um, training all new recruits in urban search and rescue? Um, yeah, that was that was certainly an, an ambition um, at this moment in time. Based on the way we are, you know, distributing staff who are new recruits into into the service, it may be that we don't do that um, because, I suppose, in the nicest possible way, uh, what tends to happen is. They will be distributed into different duty systems with different specialities uh, and rather than you know, in, invest financially in their development and then the maintenance of skills when they may not necessarily be utilized in that way it's probably far better to look at 
you know, bringing in you know, those skills as and when they form part of the urban search and rescue team. Uh, so it's just about efficiency and an effective management of, of that cohort. What we will be bringing to members over the course of the next IRMP is a real kind of focus on spreading the specialist capabilities of the service. So we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of specialisms within p- particular areas of the service, but we are well, I'm particularly keen to to spread that across the whole of Merseyside. So we have specialist capabilities at a number of locations, which complement complements the um, the strategic needs and, and address foreseeable risk. So things like terrorist attack, marine and, and flood. Um, wildfire and so on and so forth. So that will form the basis of um, the next integrated risk management plan as we look to spread out the capabilities across the whole organisation, which you know, not only makes us more effective in my view, but it also ensures that the firefighters in those locations gain no specialist competencies against particular uh, areas of, of need and foreseeable risk across Merseyside. Okay. If, uh, if no one has any further questions, then we'll, uh, we'll move to approve that report, uh, if that's agreed. Uh, so moving on then, we've got uh, item eight, which is the IRMP initial public consultation. Yeah, th- thanks, Chair. Again, this was very, very early uh, formative stages in regard to the development of the integrated management plan, but members will be familiar. We utilise an independent uh, organization to engage with the public around some of the things that the public feel re- are really important to them in the development of our plans moving forward and we seek to take that insight um, and, and develop that insight in, in the views of, of members of the authority to inform the plans and how the plans are are constructed so the actual purpose of the report is to inform members of the outcomes of a public engagement exercise which will inform the development of the 2021-2024 Integrated Risk Management Plan and the process applied in the development of the said plan. And that members uh, note the um, contents of this report. Um, During the course of what were a a number of deliberative forums, we ask members of the public their views on a a whole raft of things that we are considering. And those proposals were contained within... um, Paragraph six uh, on page uh, 234, which starts to cast uh, to glean the views and the opinions. And um, what we also sought to to consider was the strategy, the approach that we were adopting as, as Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service and how we met foreseeable risk and how we address demand. So we asked them questions around the logic that we're applying. Again, members have seen the presentation uh, previously that was delivered to members of the public, but it talked about um, risk, demand and vulnerability. And then those being factors that the, the public um, would want us to consider, how we combine them, how we looked at them, and how we considered them in the deployment of our resources. Um, and, you know, and, and categorically, you know, without exception, the public fully supported the logic that was being applied. We also looked at the planning principles that we've, we've considered previously um, and considered them in their totality. Uh, there was a couple of areas where... Um, Interestingly, members of the public uh, were, were asked around their view about the potential to close stations or merge stations, and you know, and, and, and self-evidently, you know, they recognised that on occasion you would need to merge stations or close stations. Interestingly enough, which is probably counter to one of the principles, but that was only based on performance being maintained or improved, or actually replacement of stations which were no longer fit for purpose and didn't provide the necessary facilities for our staff, particularly, funnily enough, around an equalities agenda as well as a firefighter safety perspective. But that was an important um, important question to pose to uh, to members of the public because there is the potential within the proposals to merge two stations to create a new train development academy and a super station at a particular location, maybe equidistant between the two, of which we know that we can do that and actually improve the performance. So again, it was reaffirming the views of the public in, from that perspective. We also asked them about the views around prevention and protection and, and firefighter safety, and they were well informed. And actually firefighter safety uh, was a, a key aspect of their focus and self-evidently that plays directly back into ensuring that we've got the right kit equipment, but also the right training facilities available to our staff to train against foreseeable risk and also endorse the 
the necessity to reinvest in protection um, on the basis of the Grenfell Tower fire and some of the more subsequent recommendations which have came through the Jane, Dame Judith Hackett review. So in totality, all the proposals that we were directed to uh, bring to their attention were supported. Um, and that was supported on the basis of actually maintaining the current levels of firefighter numbers or actually improving on the number of fire appliances available. So they were, you know, I was clear from the outset and none of these proposals would, would compromise the current arrangements available to the public in Merseyside. And again, that was really, you know, really well received and, and, and fully supported and endorsed. The actual um, report is contained within the appendix on page 239. And that goes into the detail about some of the things that were asked, some of the responses uh, that were provided. It was into quite a lot of detail there, really, but we will utilise that report to inform our integrated risk management plans, which we will bring back to the authority um, in the early part of next year. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Are there any questions with regard to the, uh, the IRMP initial public consultation then? No, member of it, no members have indicated, Chair. Okay, uh, in that case, uh, we're happy to approve the, uh, the item. Uh, and move on to item nine, which is a review of the area manager structure. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Again, the purpose of this report is to advise members of the proposed changes to the area manager structure uh, as part and parcel of the, the first part of the senior management uh, restructure and the specific recommendations that members approve the establishment of a fourth area manager position in protection uh, and establish and, and that position is currently uh, established on a temporary basis, but the proposal is to uh, to permanently establish the area manager position in protection whilst maintaining the 642 Grey Book establishment numbers uh, and that members note the intention to review the contractual arrangements for the area managers to provide more efficient and effective use of their time across the authority and finally to note um, that subject to the approval uh, the area managers will cover the four statutory areas of prevention, protection, response and preparedness and again, you know, without going into specific detail, I think you know, the Grenfell Tower was a, a significant game changer for all fire and rescue services. And previously we had three area managers. Uh, one area manager covered both prevention and protection. Uh, and, you know, and I think we quite understandably and the inspector reinforced this position. That individual was probably spread too thin in regards to the, the, the workload that they had. So at that time we chose to... Um, on a, uh, establish on a temporary basis the fourth area manager position into protection. That's been really effective. Uh, we are now in the throes of, of replacing our current management information system uh, for protection, which is a significant amount of work. And again, was one of the recommendations from uh, Her Majesty's in Inspectorate. Uh, and as a result of that, it's my absolutely categoric you know, view that we need to have the fifth, fourth area manager position now established on a permanent basis so we've got area managers covering uh, the kind of the key areas of prevention, protection, response, and preparedness. But uh, this will be funded through the the restructure um, of the the management team, and that report will follow uh, detail and some of the changes that we think we will apply on top of the arrangements that we've currently got in place. Again, I'm happy to take any questions on that particular area, Chair. Okay, if uh, if members want to turn on their cameras if they want to ask a question, uh, Councillor Les Byron. Yes, thank you. Just to add also, of course, we have this service level agreement with the office, uh, our chief, too uh, shy to say, but is the lead officer uh, advising the minister, advising the home office. And from a resilience point of view, there was a time in the past when we were very lean. We're still extremely lean in relationship to other authorities. But uh, in terms of resilience, having that extra strength um, at the, you know, the, the strategic line of management of the authority, I think is not just very helpful. I think it's an essential thing to have and achieve. Um, you never know what might happen and that's the essence of resilience. And I think this is a good move, generally speaking. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, and can I just ask then that, um, given there has been a there have been a few changes to the uh, the area manager governance structure, um, would it be possible to get an up to date copy of the org chart sent out to members? I think that might be helpful. 
uh, just to see where everyone's in charge. Absolutely, Chair, no problem. And we'll provide you with the, the contact details of, of, of those you know, strategic managers as well. So, so members have got direct access into them, dependent on their particular um, area of expertise. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, uh, if no one has any further questions, uh, can we take that item as, uh, as agreed? Thank you. Uh, and moving on to uh, item 10. Uh, I do want to point out again that Appendix A is exempt. So if, uh, if members have any questions with regard to anything that's actually in Appendix A, um, then can they make that clear right at the very start before they say anything? Uh, otherwise, uh, we can discuss the item um, uh, more generally. Uh, so if I can hand over to the to Chief Fire Officer. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, and the purpose of this report is to inform members of a proposal to procure a what's described as a total reward, a reward and recognition programme that's expected to provide benefits to the authority uh, in relation to staff engagement, embedding organisational values, supporting staff and recognising desired behaviours and, and good practice. So it's not singularly about um, rewarding individuals who, who work for us. There's actually some real tangible benefits from an, an organisational point of view. Uh, and we recommend that members consider and approve the proposal to procure the Perkbox Total Rewards Programme for one year, uh, and that officers will assess the expected benefits of the programme and that of the uh, and, and that the outcome of the assessment is reported back to members via the scrutiny committee uh, prior to any extension. But what the what the approach we're seeking to adopt, and rather than do what some other fire and rescue services have done over the period, um, what they've chosen to do is some kind of recognition of the contribution that staff have made in response to COVID. Um, they've given them days free from work, um, and that is quite a costly endeavour, if I'm absolutely honest with you. Uh, we've chosen not to do that here in Merseyside because it just kind of causes as, as, as many problems as it resolves. However, we did seek to try and recognise the contribution that our staff have made. Um, and as a result of that, there's, there's an aspect of this which is beneficial to those staff who, are, who have and, and are continuing to contribute in regard to the Fire and Rescue Service's contribution to the, the pandemic. Um, so there is an element of, of, of it being a, a thank you, and the, the staff do get some benefits for being part of this in relation to uh, to discounts. Um, but equally, we've got some of our staff who are you know, relatively um, you know, poorly paid in, in, in the grand scheme of things, and it certainly recognises the kind of contribution that they have made too. But it also embeds employee assistance, assistance into the programme, so where staff have had maybe suggest some kind of issues affecting their own well-being whether mental or physical it gives them a, a point of contact which they can they can access uh, through the particular uh, perk box program and a system but it also allows us as as, as the authority and, 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 and officers to to create pull surveys so rather than what we're doing at this moment in time we've gone out for the staff survey it's every two years and a lot of things can can change in a two-year period we can push out you know, pulse surveys which will give us pretty much instantaneous response to the circumstances that are currently affecting individuals. So how are they feeling now? You know, what's the response to a particular introduction of a, an idea or a plan or a strategy? Um, and we get that instantaneously back in, which will inform um, our, our kind of activities in the longer term, which I think is really a strong part of it. It also acts as a communication tool. And the way that this would be disseminated across staff, it would be on the individual's own mobile phone and so on and so forth. So it allows us to get messaging out uh, instantaneously around the, the, the corporate values and, and so on and so forth. And it is, in my view, affordable based on um, being offset against some of the other work in the longer term around employee assistance or staff survey. So, you know, we may well be able to come up with a sustainable, affordable model in the first instance rather than it just be directly a one-year provision. But that, as I say, will be subject to um, to scrutiny and review prior to um, any extension. So I think it's a real positive reflection of the contribution that staff have made over the course of the last uh, 10 months. Um, and I think it will be well received by staff, but it will also give us a huge number of organisational benefits as well. So, again, you know, I would be strongly support, well, strongly supportive of the approach uh, and uh, approval of this particular report, Chair. Happy to take any questions. Does anybody have any questions about this uh, this report? 
Hi. Hi. Councillor Coleman's raised that. Coleman. Hi. Yeah, um, I just, hang on a second, I just need to put my headphones in because otherwise you can't really hear me. Um, and would you just let us know if it's a general comment or if you intend to refer to Appendix A specifically? I think I, I think it's just a general comment. All right, thank you. Um, but if if I stray, let me know, and I'll, I'll shut up. Um, I just want I just want to say I'm a little bit disappointed um, in the re reward and recognition scheme. I I would have gone for the holiday to be honest with you, the day's holiday. And as somebody who's like, you know, being on the front line in other jobs, um, the rewards and recognition scheme sometimes they can be a bit patronising. To, you know, if I'm being if I'm being cynical and pouring cold water on things, which I like to do sometimes, um, it, it can be a bit kind. It's a bit like employee of the month thing. You know, it, I think if other authorities have found enough money to to give the workforce a day off, then give them an extra day off. I think that what they've done during COVID has been absolutely spectacular. And I think that that needs to be rewarded in a really, really meaningful way. And I think a day's holiday, an extra day's holiday that they can spend with their families, that they can um, choose to spend however they want is much, much better than um, a reward and recognition scheme like um, the perk box thing. I'm not against the perk box thing. If they want to do that as well, that's fantastic. But um, if it was me and I had to choose between one or the other, I'd have the extra day's leave. Uh, I just want to say I'm a little bit disappointed. Yeah, and 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 we have you know, we did consider um, provision of an extra day's leave. What what kind of tends to happen there is um, it's kind of it's lost, it's it's, it's received, and it, and it and it's kind of gone. And what we have to do is replace that particular individual with someone who who comes back in. So to some degree, you spend one person spends an extra time with their family, and the next person coming in spends a, a one day less with their family. So on the balance of of trying to kind of come up with something which was organisational and deliverable, um, we took it out to Kansas to certainly members of staff to say, well, look. How does this feel? Is it, you know, is this something that you would you would welcome? Uh, and you know, and pretty well, significant numbers came back and said, yeah, that's that. You know, it's it's nice to be recognised in some way, shape, or form. Because don't get me wrong, you know, as we say, some services are provided an additional day of, of leave. Others have provided absolutely nothing in regards to recognising the kind of contribution the staff have made. So we've tried to try, try and get it so we continue continue to function from an organisational point of view. Um, and you know, we recognise staff. And if I was being, you know, particularly um, critical, maybe it's probably the wrong word. I think some some people have, have have took the opportunity to say, well, people are working from home, so they can have a day off while they're working from home, uh, and it be subsumed in in that way, which is our, I suppose, what is being proposed is far more tangible and far more beneficial. And some of the some of the um, the benefit schemes that staff will. Get, you know, get as a result of this i think are really really quite positive i think it will be the first time we've done something like this uh, and i suppose the, the the view will be if at 12 months staff don't think it's you know, worth kind of continuing with then you know that would be picked up in scrutiny and we'll, we would conclude it at that particular point in time but will i think they get the day uh, off then um uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe not, but nevertheless, I think they'll have a, a year's worth of benefits rather than a day's worth of benefits. But you know, again, you know, it's for members kind of to consider. We are suggesting this is approved. Um, if members want us to go back and and review that on the basis of you know, is it feasible to uh, to to replace the scheme and um, you know choose not to implement the scheme on the basis of provision of a, a day a day's leave, then that's certainly something we'll go back and review. Well, that would be something I would favour personally. Um, but I'm interested in the fact that you've already consulted staff and had some feedback. Is there any chance that we could look at that? Yeah, it was very, it was very informal, the kind of the consultation. It was discussions with small groups of individuals saying, look, you know, this is, is what we are proposing. What do you think? I suppose if I'm being dead honest with you, what we were trying to do, given the, the, the timing of this, um, and this being the, what, the 10th of December is move this through the authority to the point where as we approach Christmas, we're able to, to I don't know, in the nicest possible way, give someone an early Christmas present in respect of 
access to the, the reward scheme. So it can, it links in. Uh, if we take this away and review it, then it's probably likely that we would have to pick that up again in, in the new year. And um, so it really was timing wise. We wanted the authority approval today to then go out to staff and say the authority have approved a, a reward and recognition scheme. And, and that's on the back of the contribution you've made over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, and, you know, and, and the benefits and the timing of that around access and some of the discounts uh, on the lead up to Christmas was probably as, as, as well timed as we could get it. And um, if that's you know, clearly not the members view, um, then we will pause this at this moment in time and then go and revisit that on the basis of, of looking at an alternative proposal. Would there be any chance of having both? I mean, I'm not going to say you can't have any of this reward and recognition if people really want it, but um, instead of a day off, you know, I'm still sort of edging towards looking at how possible given an extra day's leave is. Okay, well, uh, can I in, interject slightly, if that's all right, Chair? Okay, um... What Councillor Byron? Oh, thank you. I just wanted to try and assist. I, 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 I agree with you, Councillor Coleman. I'd like to have seen the great work that all our staff, so it's not just the firefighters, that everybody who works in the fire service had the um, fantastic contribution properly recognised. However, in, in terms of principal terms and conditions of engagement, we are part of the NJC, so for extra days off, for things that you might call more expensive items, we would be part of the national picture, local government family as well. And when this issue was bubbling up, we also had the whole issue of the Scottish government giving particular recognition, the Welsh government giving particular recognition, and yet the English government, call it that, saying... Um, no, we're going to have a freeze on public sector pay rises and terms and conditions in that respect. And this, I think, wobbled me on the political basis. I think the officers as well. What should we be doing for the right thing here? I think for the time being, this is OK. And anything that cost approaching the cost of an extra firefighter, I think, as we've discussed before, would probably be better funded or better served, shall I say, by employing an extra firefighter. Now, you would say, yeah, but that's, you know, extra firefighter, but people aren't getting recognition for that. I think what we've got here, in terms of what we can do in Merseyside, is this proposal before us. I'm still hoping that there will be national discussions, national negotiations, national consideration about the whole issue of, of recognition. I think having an extra day's leave is something for the NJC nationally to look at. And um, that is that there are discussions about that going on. What we can achieve and do here in Merseyside I think is set out in this report at this time. It may well be that we could revisit this uh, as you know public policy uh, emerges. Chair, uh, uh, Chair, Chair. Uh, Councilor Barham, if, if, if it assists, you know, picking up on the kind of comments, I think what I would be supportive of is, is you know, Councilor Coleman suggested we could maybe look at both. I think if we we can approve this report, that gives us. And that real early recognition at the conclusion of this year and as we lead into the Christmas period. But that won't stop me raising the particular issues that, that you've just highlighted there nationally in respect of acknowledgement the role of the public sector more broadly, but firefighters and, and, and fire and rescue service staff particularly. Uh, and I will make that representation to, to Home Office on, the, on that basis if members are content. That'd be good. And if you could... Um share that with us as well when you when you do make that representation if you're doing it in the form of an email or a letter that would be really helpful yeah and 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 it may i suppose i can do it formally and i can put it in a, in a letter if that would if that's the uh, the ask of members as council bar knows i speak to the home office about three times a week now 
um, and the minister on a, a, every Thursday in regards to the work that's progressing in response to the pandemic. And so I will raise it with them informally in the first instance uh, and, and await the response, but I will follow it up formally if, uh, if that's required. Thank you. Uh, in a minute, I'll ask all members to turn on their cameras. Um, I've got a final question uh, for the Chief about data. Uh, what, what data uh, will, uh, will senior fire officers have, uh, have access to with regard to the perk box? Like, will you know who's taken out a gym membership uh, or so on? No, uh, we won't have any of that kind of that personal data. The information that we will get in utilising perk box will be known to the individual, so they will re be responding to a pulse survey. Um, so it will be very much akin to that, which is the, the overall staff survey, if I'm honest with you, which is uh, anonymised and, you know, and we can't pinpoint you know, the, the, the detail to a particular individual. Uh, what you can draw out of it, I, I think, and again, I'm not a, a, a proficient as others are or will be, um, you know, we can recognise the amount of benefit that's been secured by people working in the organisation. So at a point in time, we may be able to say on the basis of this, our staff have benefited by X number of thousand pounds based on the, uh, the, the rewards that they've secured through the, the utilization of the application. Um, but it won't, it won't be down to individual uh, data and certainly we won't know who's got a gym membership and who's not and who's going to Pizza Hut and who's not. So, uh, so be assured by that. Okay, thank you. Uh, can all members turn their cameras on at this point, please? And can I ask the meeting facilitator to unmute everyone to provide you with the opportunity to, uh, to raise any final issues? Okay. And uh, can anyone who wants to speak uh, indicate now for me? Do you, do you want to speak, Councillor Rennie? No, no, sorry, sorry, just pressing the wrong button. Sorry. Apologies. Okay. okay. Uh, so can we take the, uh, the recommendations as approved then? Okay, so they've been approved, thank you. Uh, if you can all turn your cameras off again, uh, and we'll go on to the, uh, the, the final item, which is uh, an exempt item. So at this point, I think we need to stop broadcasting. Yeah, we're just going to close the, the meeting to press.